every area in all parts of the world has those area-specific urban legends that just refuse to die. Whether the stories are about a haunted asylum on the outskirts of the city, a creature that lives in the nearby woods, or a ghost that haunts a lonely stretch of road outside of town, there's always a common thread within the tales. No one has ever been to these places, seen the creatures, or witnessed any hauntings with their own eyes. There are members of every generation who will proclaim that they know someone whose brother's best friend's sister went to that haunted house with 13 floors that used real blood and snakes and spiders and is so scary that no one has ever made it all the way through. Those same people will swear by those stories without ever being able to provide a shred of evidence or a name of someone who could provide proof of the claims simply because everyone around here knows that it's a true story. The storytellers eventually pass the tales on to their children, who modify them just enough to keep up with changing times, and the cycle continues. I'm as skeptical as anyone when it comes to these stories, seeing as I was like a junkie when I was younger, constantly searching for more terrifying stories about whatever area of the country I was living in at the time. I made up and spread stories about haunted pizza parlors in New York, my cousin's encounter with the Jersey Devil, or how my grandfather encountered a feral, human-like demon creature in the woods of Colorado. I even broke the one rule with these stories by putting myself in them. This took guts, in hindsight, because I had to make sure that I always told them the same way. Surprisingly, no one ever called my bluff. I like to think that I have had some wonderful contributions to various urban legends around the Midwest and Northeastern states. I moved around a lot. There was always a surge of joy whenever I would wander the halls at school and hear one of my classmates retelling my stories to another one of their friends adding little bits here and there like a massive game of telephone. I knew, of course, that the stories were complete fiction, but I stood my ground whenever anyone asked me about them. I would even manage to act a little bit, speaking with a shaky voice or looking scared when I would recount a situation that I supposedly experienced myself. I suppose this aspect of my childhood has led to my current predicament, which I will recount in full for the internet to take from it what they will. I've laid this little introduction out as sort of a disclaimer, aimed particularly at those who will call my story into question. I've been like the boy who cried wolf for years, but I assure you with every ounce of honesty and integrity that I have, that this time, the wolf is real. For my introduction, it's probably apparent that I moved around the country quite a bit in my middle and high school years. Neither of my parents had anything to do with any branch of the armed forces. They simply didn't tend to hang around any given place for too long. I suppose it had some sort of effect on me, but I wasn't hurt by it or anything of the sort. Growing up, I was a complete ham. I made friends very easily, was often the class clown, and because of that, was often disliked by my teachers. Again, this was never an issue, as I was usually in another state by the time the next semester rolled around. My friendships were often fleeting, as were any positive relationships that I ever had with my teachers. Because of the events that followed, my memory of one teacher in particular is probably slightly skewed, but I'll attempt to give the least biased version of our friendship that I can. Mr. Mays was one of my social studies teachers in the early years of my high school experience. Being older now, I can understand how horrible children are to deal with around that age, and I respect him to no end for the way that he was able to connect with his students. He seemed like one of us. He talked like us, made pop culture references that were current, listen to cool music, and sometimes he'd even say hell or damn while he was giving a passionate lecture about Native American history or something like that. A teacher that swore, even a little bit, was the epitome of cool to a freshman in high school. My memories of Mr. Mays mostly stem from the way that he really got into anything that he was doing. The instance that's still very vivid in my mind was, of course, around Halloween of my sophomore year. Mr. Mays had the typical teacher decorations around the classroom, smiling jack-o'-lanterns and black cat cartoons, typical and boring in the minds of egotistic high school students. However, on the 31st of October, when most other teachers were rolling their eyes at the fact that teenagers still took dressing up in costumes on Halloween seriously, Mr. Mays took the whole cool teacher thing to a new level. We walked into the classroom and were surprised to find the blinds drawn, sheets over the smaller windows, candles lighting the room, and a single, frowning jack-o'-lantern sitting on a stool in front of the desks. Mr. May sat at his desk, just watching the students come into class and take their seats. 
he didn't have to ask anyone to be quiet because the moment everyone walked into the room, they were either too excited to care about petty conversations or too confused to bother with him. The students took their seats as Mr. Mays began his lecture. He spoke quietly to set the mood and took a seat on a chair right next to the jack-o'-lantern in the center of the room. Today is probably my favorite day of the year, class, he said in a monotonous voice. Halloween is my favorite holiday, and I want to share with you exactly why I love it so much. One girl raised her hand with a concerned look on her face. I'm pushing the due date for your papers to next Tuesday, said Mr. Mays, without bothering to look at the girl, who slowly put her hand down, looking around at the other students with a hint of embarrassment. The class erupted in quiet cheers, and Mr. Mays waited for the inevitable silence. He began his story immediately after the class had calmed down. I will attempt to recreate the amazing story that Mr. Mays told the class that day. The way in which he told this story rendered the horror junkies speechless and the rest of the class terrified. The same girl that had raised her hand to ask about the paper was holding her knees to her chest by the end of it, a look of terror on her face. The important thing to know was what the story was about. The specifics slip my mind now and aren't too relevant. I'll try to recount the parts of the story that matter the most, but don't hold me to it. Basically, Mr. Mays and his friends set out on a road trip around the country after graduating from college. They took a truck, loaded it with camping gear, and set out to sightsee for the entire summer. The group went from Poconos in New Jersey, down to the coasts of Florida, New Orleans, to California, and up to Washington. From there, they went to the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and then back home to New York. This concept of freedom to travel anywhere had the entire class hooked in an instant. Mr. Mays was the coolest teacher ever in my eyes. Being adventurous college kids, the group didn't bring a map. There were no time constraints, so they just kind of drove in the general direction that they wanted to go and eventually found a town to stay in or some place that looked interesting. He told us that after spending a week in Colorado, he and his friends had to travel through miles and miles of corn, plains, and more corn. He assumed that they were either in Nebraska or Kansas when they decided to pool their extra cash and stay in a hotel for a night. They settled into a motel in some town that Mr. Mays could barely remember the name of when one of his friends realized that they were somewhere near his grandfather's farm. He wasn't entirely sure where it was, but being adventurous college kids, they decided to get a quick refund from the motel and try to contact the friend's grandpa. They were unable to get a hold of the grandpa on the phone, so the group figured it would be fun to just show up. Mr. May's friend was adamant that his grandparents would take them in and feed them without a moment of hesitation, so the group set out with an hour of sunlight, seeking the salvation of a comfortable house to stay in. In Kansas or Nebraska, wherever it may have been, there aren't a whole lot of natural markers that could guide lost travelers. Any directions given to someone who didn't live around the area basically amounted to Go up a couple miles to the corn, take a right, and go down a dirt road to the other corn. There should be some wheat on your right. So, as is the case in most scary stories, the group got lost. Never wanting to admit defeat, they drove into the night, making wrong turns every five minutes until they found themselves on a wooded road that Mr. May's friend was certain that his grandparents lived off of. Mr. Mays described the road as basically a dark path to hell. I wasn't entirely sure how true this was, because he got very excited and a bit ridiculous with his explanation of the trees that almost tried to grab the car, and the red eyes of countless animals looking at them from the darkness. Regardless, the typical horror tropes worked on most of the class. Everyone was terrified. So the group of guys drove on this dark road for about 15 minutes before they came to a clearing and a small building with lights in it, and what seemed to be a silo. They figured that, at the very least, the people who lived here would be able to help them find where the guy's grandparents lived. The whole idea of everyone knows everyone in these hick parts of the country fueled this hope. They pulled the car up near the building, realized when they were out of the car that it appeared to be like the kind of places where one would store a whole bunch of chickens, not a home. Still, the lights were on, so they figured they'd give it a try. They approached the building as a group looking in the semi-open sliding door to find a big, empty room. Hanging fluorescent lights lit the room like it was daytime, and they couldn't see a soul. There were no cars, but one of Mr. May's friends was convinced he'd seen someone as they pulled up, 
So they decided to go inside and see if there was an office or something where someone might still be working. Why else would they have this huge place lit up like that? There were no doors on the inside of the building. Again, it was just a giant empty hall. So the group roamed around the property and over towards the silo. As they got closer, they noticed what appeared to be a cellar door. At this point, I remember Mr. Mays telling the entire class to learn from his idiocy. He told us that he hadn't seen many horror movies before that time and didn't think twice about approaching a creepy cellar door in the middle of a dark, scary, foreign place. He said that approaching that door was one of his biggest regrets. Mr. Mays let the whole class know that he was going to tell us as much as he deemed appropriate about the experience. He felt that we were mature enough to handle it, but advised anyone that was squeamish to leave class early. Several students quietly gathered their things and walked out the door, a couple of them being stoners who saw this as an opportunity to smoke behind the school before their next class. I didn't even give the announcement a second thought. Like I said, I was and am a sucker for this kind of stuff, and Mr. Mays was telling a story better than anything I'd ever conjured up. I wanted to learn from this guy, even though I didn't believe much of the story. After the class had thinned a bit, Mr. Mays continued with the story. He told the remaining few that he and his friends opened that cellar door, releasing a smell that he only described as the most putrid thing my senses have ever experienced. The group was no longer concerned with finding the owners of the property, but was now set on finding the source of that smell. They went down the steps into the cellar which was lit by single bulbs spaced sporadically along the ceiling of a long hallway. No one spoke. Things had gotten too strange. The walls were lined with metal sheeting, similar to the roofing on farms. The hallway itself was crooked, and the ceilings constantly lowered in rows like a tunnel that was hastily dug and then never touched up. There were sections where the boys had to almost crouch in order to pass. The worst part, Mr. Mace told us, was that the light bulbs continuously flickered, sometimes acting like a strobe light and making it very difficult to move through the winding and unstable hallways. In hindsight, he was certain that his mind was playing tricks on him, but he remembered seeing flashes of things that couldn't be there. He said that when you're focused on something, or if you're that nervous, your mind can do that to you. It can simply revolt, showing you things or people that aren't there. He continued to describe the hallway, and I was on the edge of my seat. The halls were windy and seemed to go on forever. Mr. Mays guessed that they were somewhere under the creepy forest they'd driven through when they found a door, but he couldn't be sure. He said that they came upon a door after walking for what felt like a mile. It was simple and wooden, but it looked like it belonged outside of a suburban home. It had a nice design, seemed to be freshly painted red, and had a very nice knob and knocker on it. It was a door that belongs at the entrance to a nice house, not one that would be sitting in a dirt tunnel in the middle of nowhere. His friend walked towards the door, moving carefully because of the flashing light bulb and increasingly uncertain about the stability of the surrounding walls. He turned to the group, the rest of which were nervous at the very least and attempted to lighten the mood with a laugh before he said, I should probably knock first. 